Greetings, sons and daughters of the living God, and welcome to our 13th and last installment on The Crucibles. At Solus University, we have had the privilege of coming to your homes, to your spaces, to your churches, and sharing from the Word of God. And we are not taking this for granted. We are ever so grateful for your kindness and the time that you have expended to listen to the presenters that have come to you. We look forward to the coming quarter and we hope you're going to tune into MNS Creativus and continue to fellowship with us at Solusi University. Before we go into the study for the day, why don't we thank God for the last 18 weeks that he has been with us. Let us pray. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you dear Lord for having led thus far and replaced an Ebenezer stone to say thus far the Lord has been with us and we thank you for life. We thank you even for life's lessons that you have equipped us with as we go into this last study, which places Christ in the eye of the storm. Uh, dear Lord, may you give us hope and strength to shoulder on and soldier on. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask, Amen. Dear friends, Christ is at the center of the storm for this week. We have had interesting topics over the last quarter. Topics like the shepherd's crucible, the crucibles that come, the bad cage where we were taught how to sing songs in crucibles and come out with the right tune and pitch. We looked at the goldsmith's face where we were supposed to be processed until the face of Christ is reflected in us. We also looked at struggling with all energy where we needed to look at some of those principles that we have to look at and abide by them so that even as we go through, there is resistance that we face, but we must still make it. We also looked at the indestructible hope. And on this indestructible hope, against all the odds, let us continue to have our hope built on nothing less but on Jesus Christ, who is our solid rock. We also spoke about seeing the invisible, how we are all tech-savvy, we never mind about how our phones work. We do not worry about how our computers work. And yet the plan of heaven is even more advanced. There is an invisible force where we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities of darkness. And there is invisible, invisible force that fights our battles. And we also looked at a life of praise. When it does not make sense, Prof. Zondasara referred to this as a counterintuitive that we need to look at how we go about all these issues in life. And besides a life of praise, there's also meekness. This is controlled power where we appreciate that there's a bigger plan. God is in control and we become meek like Moses. And we also looked at waiting in the crucible. Uh, in waiting in the crucible, this is where you are dealing with some of those situations that call upon us to exercise patience, self-control, and discipline while we are in the crucible and not behave like popcorns that are quick to jump out of the receptacle, but remain in situ and remain in place. And then last week, we looked at dying like a seed. We need to take on the form of Christ, who did not count it robbery to become equal with man, but he let go of heaven like a seed so that even as he dies, he can germinate. As he regeminates, grow, and this kingdom shall grow. As it grows, it shall give birth to many more, and more seeds come out of that one seed. If only we can die to self and emulate the life of Christ until you become a living sacrifice. Brother Lamini covered that section last week. Now, this week, having covered the summary of the whole week, of the whole quarter. Now you want to look at what Christ went through. Christ, as we come to the reading of the day, is in the eye of the storm. And we're going to find this in the book of Matthew chapter 27, the verse is 46. I read it in the New King James Version. It says, quote unquote, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthan, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The author of the study guide places Christ in the crucible. 
and identifies this place as the eye of the storm. When Christ cries, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthan, my God, my Father, why have you forsaken me? It is only when we are forsaken by God that we reach the top, the apex, the echelon of crucibles. Many of us, we have not yet reached the place where we can say God has forsaken us for real. We only imagine it. We only think that could be the state of affairs. But this is not so. Where Christ now says, my father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? This is something that was literal. Even though it was a spiritual issue, this is something that was really happening. Christ had indeed been separated from the Father. And yet, the rest of us, here is the assurance that Paul gives us, what shall separate us from the love of God? Nothing, nothing. Now, let us work our way to the outer perimeter and then work our way in. You know, when you go back to the book of Luke chapter 2, the verses 7, by this time, Christ is about to be born. And there is no room for him to be received. As a result, we sing when we get to, to, to our Christmas sessions about Christ being born in a manger. As he is born in this manger, what should we appreciate? That this was a crucible before he even entered earth. The crucible is no accommodation. Before he even enters earth, no gifts to receive. And as he is received in a manger, that is the first crucible that is introduced to. Fast forward to Matthew chapter 2, you look at verses 1 up to 18. Now he has been born, and the three magi, the three wise men, the wise men come from the east, and they say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews so that we may worship him? As they seek to worship him, they tell Herod. So Herod gives them this explicit instruction, on your way back, come through here and tell me about the presence of this new king in my territory so that I may go and worship him. As a result of this, there is a hunt that begins. When he notices that he has been hoodwinked by this wise man, he goes off to hunt Christ. Because Christ has been taken off to Egypt as an emigrant for safety, Herod goes on to have all the children that are less than two years put to death. Why does he do this? So that he can be the only king. But in the thematic structure of our study, this is yet another crucible where Christ is not in a position to defend himself, but the system of the day has turned against him. This is a political system. This is the power of the day. Some of us are facing political upheavals. And these are forms of crucibles that we're suffering. And this particular study helps us to appreciate that Christ is still at the center of it all. He went through such a crucible. And thereafter, let's look at John 8, the verse is 58 and 59. This is yet another interesting incident. In John chapter 8, what has Christ done? Christ has gone out to speak to the fellow Jews. And as he speaks to them, he tells them, before Abraham was, I am. These people that he ministers unto, they seek to stone him. They begin to actually cast stones at him. And the Bible records at verse 59 that he went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and passed by. You know, these are some of the things that we're going to face when we are on the Lord's work. We may be subjects of stoning. We may be targets of stoning. Some of these exercises are going to be successful. This was the case with Stephen. He was stoned. This was the case with almost all the other uh, apostles of Christ. They lost their lives as they shared the good news. So Christ finds himself in a crucible where he is not received by those who are the intended targets of the word. Some of the people that we share the good news with are not going to receive it so well. They may decide to take even our lives. They may decide to treat us as persona non gratis. They may decide to uh, treat us as outcasts. And I I'm reminded of the part where Christ actually goes out and he's calling in disciples. And uh, as he's calling in disciples, one of them uh, retorts, having been told we have found the Messiah. He inquires what good can come out of Nazareth. You know, the, the fact that you're not going to be believed in spite of your best intentions, it can be so disheartening. It can be so disheartening. And, and, and Christ does not end there. He has another crucible. 
We have seen him suffer a crucible as a child. We have seen him suffer a crucible from a political system. We have seen him suffer a crucible in the hands of those he sought to minister unto. Christ goes on to Gethsemane. Now he knows he's about to die. As he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane, he goes out to pray. He goes with his disciples and he asks them to tarry a bit as he goes just nearby to pray with them. And while the rest of the disciples, they go up to sleep, they slumber. And he inquires, could you wait with me just but a little bit? As Christ is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prays unto the Father and three times he calls, if this cup will pass me by, let it be so. But if you are not willing to remove this cup, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. This is Christ as he petitions heaven. By now, notice he has suffered physical trouble. He has suffered an accommodation crisis as a child. And he even testifies that the Son of Man has no place to even lay his head. He is just but a humble pauper. That was the status of Christ. He had physical wants that were not met. But now he carries his messianic role to its climax. At this point, he begins to carry the sins of the world. So as he feels the weight of these sins, he now calls upon the Father and he says, let this cup pass me by. But nonetheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Now, this is something that we also need to appreciate that when we are talking about being in the center of crucibles, we need to appreciate that it is God's will that ought to be done. Done before we come into the crucibles, done when we are in the crucibles, done when we are still transition from the perimeter to the eye of the storm. So Christ is now praying, and after this prayer, this is where Malchus and the servants of the high priest come and apprehend Christ. And Peter goes into defense mode and he strikes off the ear of Malchus. Christ even defends Malchus at this point, and having defended and restored his ear, he takes off to be tried. This is now the Passion Week, where Christ carries our sins right to the cross. So as we looked at the memory text, which was in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, now we find Christ having been found guilty, and yet he's innocent. While he is being hung on the cross, he takes this opportunity, number one, to forgive those who are sinning against him. Number two, to pardon a thief that is on the other side. What should we understand about Christ being at the eye of the storm? He goes through this experience, but still blesses others. As we have gone through this quarter, the quarter has sought to move us to an appreciation whereby we do not just say, because I'm having it tough, I have a reason to be mean. Christ, while he hangs on the cross, while he is losing life, the Bible says there was an earthquake, and out of that earthquake, people who were saints were restored to life, and they were resurrected and seen walking right into Jerusalem. This is when he is in the eye of the storm the highest of crucibles. And this is a lesson for you and I. It is no excuse that you are having it tough to become nasty. It is no excuse. And number two, just in case you're thinking, I have had the worst of it all. You haven't had what Christ went through. Because Christ had it all. You want to say, I want to build my hope on him who has suffered more. Not only has he suffered more in person, but he has suffered for me, he has suffered for you. This is the relationship that we ought to build as we look at Christ. We want to appreciate what he gave for us to be where we are. It could have been worse had it not been for Christ. It could have been worse. My dear friends, we have come to the end of our discussion. Yes, all of us have sinned, and we have come short of the glory of God. But because of Christ, who took it upon himself, to go right into the center of the crucible. He has made it possible for you and I to become heirs of the kingdom. May the good Lord who has seen us through lesson number one up to lesson number 13 continue to be our strength, continue to be our stay. May he be the one who will shoulder us, carry us in the eyes of the storms where we are at. 
They may appear like they are small storms in the eyes of others, but not with God. He says, Lo, I am with you always. I've been through my own storm. Even though you are to carry your own cross, you shall not carry it in vain. It is a yoke from me. Take my yoke. It is lighter from you. Why don't we pray and bless the name of the Lord before we go our separate ways. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, for the study we have just had, oh dear Lord, how I pray that you may increase our faith in the crucibles and help us to appreciate, just in case we were becoming crybabies, that you have even carried more for our sake. Give us this hope that if you have made it at the higher level, you will help us at the lowest level. And dear Lord, when all is said and done, all these lessons have been read, they have been shared, they have been watched, they have been listened to. How we pray, dear Lord, that our characters may be perfected for heaven. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask until we meet again. Amen and amen. Oh,